Can I tell you now that Jake's arrival will start the meeting with ah, Ka Karakia from Councillor Templeton? Takataka te hau ki te uru, takataka te hau ki te tonga, kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā tara tara ki tai, e hi akeana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hohu, tihei mauri ora. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, a few apologies this morning. We've got apologies from the Mayor and Councillor Goff for absence and uh, Councillor Chu and McDonald for lateness. Um, I'll move them. Do we have a seconder? Pauline. All those in favour? Against? Carried. And just to note that Councillor Chu will be zooming in when she's able to. Uh, I've had no declarations of interest. Um, if there are any, please make me aware before we get to the item. A confirmation of previous minutes from the 5th of August. Um, do I have a mover? Councillor Templeton, seconder. Councillor Chen. Um, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Carried. Uh, public forum. We have two public forums this morning. The first one is Viviana Zenisa from the Phillipstown Community Centre Charitable Trust. Um, well, that doesn't look like Viviana, but welcome, Viviana. Welcome. Good morning. So, thank you. So you have f five minutes to uh, yep. talk. That would include any um, questions as, as well, if, you, if there's time. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. As you heard, um, the manager of the Philipstown Community Centre Charitable Trust. And today I would like to bring to your attention the condition of Ferry Road between Wilson's Road and the Old Wings Road in Philipstown. While Philip, uh, Ferry Road in Central has been somehow attended and Ferry Road in Wollstone um, has been redeveloped, Ferry Road in Phillipstown um, looks like it has been missed out and we think that there are some concerns and um, reasons of concerns and some issues in the area. Um, I have some photos um, that I took. So um, first of all, well, the first reason of concern is related to the main basic maintenance or actually the lack of basic maintenance on the road as you can see the asphalt and the pathway um, are broken in different parts of the road there are holes and uh, this can apart from creating a more unpleasant road ferry road is great polluted busy and noisy um, this has an impact on the um, pedestrians and the bikers and their safety Similar situation is for the drains. All of them, apart from two, um, are blocked. They are broken and they create uneven surfaces. Um, the parking is also a matter of concern because the parking spaces are designed half on the road and half on the pathway. And as it, you can see, uh, cars park more often towards the pedestrian side. So the, uh, the pathway, is shared between pedestrians and cars and often also with bicycles as it appears that some bikers do not feel comfortable in biking along um, the cycleway that is the one on the right of the parked cars. The cycleway can be an issue, especially towards the intersection with old winds where the cycleway is serving actually those um, biking to, uh, forward towards Woolstone but it's not really useful for those turning left or right, especially for those turning right. They need to challenge the odd, going to the um, mixing with the cars and being the, uh, the last fault in the trying to turn from the big intersection there. And the last reason of concern is the pedestrian crossings. I counted four pedestrian crosses crossing um, along Ferry Road between Wilson's and Old Wings, where actually two of them are not, how can you call them like zebra or crossing lines, but they are more like gaps where you have like a sort of highland in the middle of the road to allow people to cross half of the street um, each time. So the 
the problem is that the first three pedestrian crossings are really in the first 300 meters of the road, leaving the, uh, the, the other 500 meters without any crossing points. Um, we are requesting that council, um, oh, I'm sorry. That's all right, take your time. I think that I didn't share the presentation. You have, you have, okay. you have, yes. We are Sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, we're moving it along, so that's, that's good. I'm really sorry. Um, what I'm, I, uh, what we would like to ask is that council de de um, department works um, inside the current budget, um, together with the Philips and communities, the businesses, the people, the trust to make ferry road more safe, business more business friendly, and a better, a better maintained road. And I think I'm trying to come back. Great. Look, thank you very much for that uh, excellent public forum. And we, we were looking at the pictures, which are very telling. Um, and, and during your presentation, also, the, the head of transport's been listening. So she's been taking notes of the concerns and issues that you have, have raised. Um, so what, what I'll do is I'll um, we'll just ask for some advice back from, from staff on those concerns and what we can do. Um, obviously, we're going into a period where we'll be developing the draft annual plan. Um, so this is quite good information for us to, to know um, and help inform and shape the, the annual plan. I, I understand there is money on budget currently for the, um, the three crossing points. It sits out a, little, a few years, I think, in financial year 2023. Um, and then further out, there's more money um, for PT improvements down there. Um, but looking at the state of the street, obviously, it's not in the best state of repair. So I think we need to get some advice from, from staff. Uh, just to see what we can do within our current budgets um, and how we can work that into the, the annual plan. Have you um, addressed the community board as well, been to the community board regarding this? Uh, not, uh, no. Um, I understand that there are um, reasons why. So if you approach the community board, you can't go to council. So um, it's not uh, still really clear what how we should manage those, yeah, how we should cho choose those, um, who to address. But yeah, we thought to come directly to council because, yeah, we thought it was the right subcommittee to address. Okay, no, that, that, that's fine. And there's three um, community board members on, on council that obviously are aware of this and, we'll, and I'm sure the community board will advocate on, on your behalf as, as well. Um, look, there, there's no time for any questions. But thank you very much for, um, for your presentation. Um, and we've taken it all on board and are very aware now of the situation in, in, on Ferry Road in Phillipstown. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we've just got a, a resolution up there um, to refer the issues raised to, um, we might put a title in there. If that's possible, yeah. please. Yeah, do you want to move that? I just asked because they also made a long-term plan submission, and the reason that oh, this... Sorry, sorry, we're not having questions. No, no, um, I was just, wanna... in terms of the resolution one, it might be good to also refer the long-term plan submission yeah. as well L to L start. Lynette's in the room, so, so she, she understands the history of this as, as well. Um, um, Thank you. And also just a time frame on it, because that's been one of the problems is the timing. The okay, can we just put to help inform the annual plan, please? Okay, do you want to, do you want to move it or not? Because I'll happily Yeah, yeah, no, no, happy okay. to move it. I just think we need to put ti the timing in so that it's clear that it can actually help us make a budget decision. Yeah. Okay, all those in favour? Mike, when you say report, are you calling for a report? No, I just want advice. So report back. It's not asking for a report, though. To what date? Can I just check what date we need to get that back to inform the draft annual plan? Oh, I don't think we need to have a precise date. It's it's in there to make sure it informs the the annual plan, so that's actually been captured. Um, so, Yana, you've moved it. Jake, you've seconded it. The next two weeks. All those in favour? Aye. Opposed? Carried.
Okay, the next uh, public forum is from Axel down at Wilkie. Um, welcome, Axel, and I see Glenn's with you as well. Um, obviously, you had quite a few things that you, you want to talk to, so I've allowed 10 minutes for this public forum. Um, so I'll get, let you get started. Thank you. Yeah, kia ora koutou katoa. Thank you for having us. Um, so we wanted to talk about short-term transport emission reduction measures on behalf of the Chat Club. Uh, for those who don't know what the Chat Club is, Chat stands for Canterbury Housing and Transport, uh, and is particularly focused on, I guess, the interaction between transport and land use and, and mainly the Greater Christchurch area. Uh, and we've been uh, set up for about three years now, uh, a small group of us uh, sort of trying to initiate discussion. We've had a number of workshops and seminars. I know Councillor Templeton uh, presented at one of them. Uh, and we are keen to keep trying to push the conversation and, and raising the level of information uh, about these issues uh, in this area. And there's quite a very active uh, Facebook group as well that uh, also has discussions and articles. Okay. Oh, it's not progressing. Oh, you got it. Um, right, here we go. Um, so council has obviously declared a, a climate emergency and also uh, joined uh, Rise to Zero. And uh, the question, of course, is um, why do that? You know, is it is it about uh, um, doing the right thing? I think it needs to be recognized that that's just an introduction to what needs to be done uh, to get our emissions down. And uh, and the why uh, I, it became very clear to me why this is necessary is this is some real anxiety amongst people, you know, what is life going to be in decades to come? And I was having dinner with a friend of mine the other week, and uh, she's pregnant with a second child and had a, a good cry, you know, was it not irresponsible of her bringing another child in the world? And what world is this child going to um, grow up in? And so I think that's what, um, what it's all about, uh, um, addressing people's anxiety about what will happen in the future. And so um, just a couple of suggestions. Here's the first one, very simple. Uh, we have bus lane operating hours uh, that, that are very narrow. Uh, I took this photo on a bus uh, the other week uh, at 1 p.m. Uh, the bus stuck in some almighty uh, traffic jam and couldn't use the bus lane because the bus lane operating hours kick in two hours after this uh, photo was uh, taken. Many arterial routes experience the highest traffic volume on a Saturday at lunchtime. And there's hardly a bus lane in town that operates on a Saturday. So uh, m maybe people who use buses on a Saturday are worth less. I don't know. But uh, it's a very simple thing that council could do rather simply and quickly. Um, uh, acknowledging that all the research uh, shows us the most important thing when it comes to uh, people making uh, the choice of using public transport is travel time reliability. That is the number one issue to them, and that is what bus lanes achieve. Um, you've all uh, probably heard many a time that more than half of our transport emissions come from um, that our emissions in Christchurch come from transport. And uh, so I've pulled the uh, data from the Ministry of Transport's Household Travel Survey and just plotted that just to illustrate how do people in Christchurch actually travel. That's distance travel per year. And, uh, uh, and so the black bars, uh, they are those transport modes that emit emissions and the green ones uh, don't. And and what I wanted to just illustrate is if, you know, at some point in the future, we might agree that we reduce emissions by 30% or 50% or whatever the number might be. Uh, but whatever it is, we are not going to address transport emissions by trying to focus on growing uh, these small little bars here on the right-hand side of the screen. If we want to reduce emissions, we have to directly tackle this and figure out how do we make driving less attractive and if we don't have the guts to do that we will just not make a difference and uh, 
uh, a few years ago, I listened to um, somebody, uh, the uh, chief transport planner from San Francisco at a conference. He was talking about transport planning and he wasn't talking about parking, but he um, he started his presentation by saying, if you don't have a strong planning policy for parking, you might as well forget about your other transport planning too. He was saying that because um, parking really drives people's decision-making on um, how they travel to a very large extent. And so what I would suggest to the city to consider um, something that can be done in the short term is, is to start charging for on-street parking where the occupancy on the street is above a certain threshold, you know, be it 70, be it 80%, whatever the figure might be, um, in order not to upset um, the local residents, you really need to exclude them for them and offer them to buy a parking permit. Um, and that's not a central city initiative that should apply anywhere in Christchurch where parking occupancy is, is higher than uh, what's, uh, what, whatever gets agreed on. So these are industrial suburbs, business parks, around malls, around the big tertiary providers. And then um, um, the revenue um, could be given to the regional council for them to improve public transport so that you don't just have a stick, uh, but also a carrot um, for them to improve the frequency of the services. And if they, um, this all sounds a little bit uh, far out there is exactly what Queenstown has been doing since 2017 and uh, they tripled their tr public transport use within a few months to a level that's higher than what we do in Christchurch and I think th that's I really wanted to uh, come back to this and and just quickly say if we do not make driving less attractive there is no uh, mathematical chance that we will ever reduce transport emissions um, to a meaningful extent. And that's really all I wanted to say. And I've got another slide about another topic, but I want to uh, uh, leave some time for you to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alan Glenn. Is there any questions? Silence. Oh, yeah, Tim. Um, Axel, with your comments with regards to the bus lanes, has um, ECAN made any comment on your suggestions or have you been there? Because I noticed in your last slide you're saying, also asking for, you know, or saying that there should be free buses within the four avenues for Metro card holders only. I'd imagine that it would be better just to have for everybody so they get used to it. But your comments on both those, please? Uh, yes, I. The reason I'm talking here is uh, I was sitting actually addressing the full ECAN Council in August um, with those uh, three very topics and they uh, encouraged me um, to um, come to this committee as well. So what I was basically saying to ECAN is, look, uh, it would be great if you could um, work together um, with the city uh, because uh, whilst you are in charge of public transport, you we can, um, whether you are successful with this um, is really driven by things that is that are controlled by the city council and, you know, for example, through the bus lane operating hours or um, to, to make parking available for commuters for free um, all day long. And I think it's important to think back to that balance of carrots versus sticks. We have rolled out a number of good carrots uh, and are looking to do more, like, say, improved bus frequencies, uh, rolling out a fantastic cycleway network and so forth. But you need to identify the sticks as well. At the moment, we've done those things at the same time as also building, for example, quite an extensive motorway network in and around Christchurch as well, which hasn't really been a stick on the other side there. And, and we've seen overseas similar evidence where they've done either provided the sticks or not provided the sticks uh, in conjunction with some great sustainable transport initiatives. And it's quite clearly made the difference or not as to whether people have changed their behaviours. I um, just want to correct you. It's the government that built the motorways, not the council, just saying. So. Fair comment. But... Or, or the council allowed to go through the Cranford base. Um, just a quick question from me before the time's up. Um, 
obviously one of the concerns is the fact that we have ECAN running the service and then the council providing the infrastructure. Um, so you've got having to go through two different decision makers. Do you think there'd be benefit of just having one decision maker look after both the infrastructure and the service? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. But uh, I guess uh, the the more uh, fundamental questions, um, like what drives people's decision making uh, for what uh, mode of transport to choose, and you know yeah. how this then reflects itself in in the emissions profile, um, is something that can be. Um, th they need quite different decisions, and it doesn't really. Uh, depend on the governance model um, um, that's there. So th those decisions can be made with, within the existing framework. Okay. Thank you very much for your, for your time and the um, thoughts that you've given us. Great. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Okay, there's no deputations and there are no petitions. Uh, item 7, which is the receipt of the Central City Parking and Restrictions Subcommittee Minutes from the 1st of September. Happy to move that. Do I have a seconder? Jake, uh, all those in favour? Any against? <laughs> Carried. Uh, what's that? Can we get stuff? Yeah. I'm just going to quickly pop down to item 9 which is the major cycleway South Express Section 2, detailed traffic resolutions. Uh, this is just a technical report uh, following the decision we made last term just to legalise all the traffic um, resolutions. Is there any questions of staff? Jimmy. Yeah. I, I have a uh, three questions. The first one is only the typo mistake on top of the page 108. There's a main source rule rather than main nose rule. Okay, because I'm not a Papa Louis the council, I'm Hongbi council. Okay. Oh, there's two chocolate fish. Yeah, okay. There's a bus more, that's okay. Se uh, se second question is uh, this section, high high to Craven, actually is in the uh, uh, Hongbi Hosewell Richter Community Board, particularly in the Hongbi Ward. So I'm not sure this uh, detail the uh, traffic resolution, whether it's uh, make briefings to the community board or not. Not on the traffic detailed traffic resolutions. The briefings were done on the yes. on the completion of the report yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah. the completion of the scheme. So they were all done yes. back in 2019 when we just before July 2019 when yes. the committee at the time approved that. This is just marking up what was, this is the legalisation of what was agreed back then. Okay. Known read doesn't have a briefing. Okay, but, but like this case, some other uh, the, the case, similar one, you know, some other the, the uh, major cycle rule is still the same. Not, not the, you know, make a briefing to the community board. No. Never on, only this one. Sorry, I don't. So th this, I mean, it's a detailed this is the traffic same process. Investigation. So the community boards get okay. briefed on the cycleways as it's going through the consultation, etc. But oh, okay, this is okay. whenever it's a detailed traffic same resolution. Same principle. Yeah, it just comes to the committee to to, to sign. Okay, so thank you, Chair. Resolved as okay. part of the resolutions at that time to come back to this committee okay. to do these detailed traffic resolutions. Okay, thank you. Last question is uh, Anna. I mean, uh, my understanding uh, back to the, uh, July 2021, about, oh, sorry, it's uh, 19, two years ago, uh, the community or uh, resident, they have made uh, uh, the submissions uh, during the, the uh, ITE the committee. Yes. I'm not sure regarding the final detailed traffic resolution in which part or which area no, has been reflected to uh, the uh, submission I, I, I or can, not. I can uh, yeah. answer that. Uh, so, so obviously all of the considerations were done at the time we made the decision. So yeah, we were yeah, aware yeah. of the community's concern at that time um, and yeah. we made a decision um, and that decision is now in front of us with the traffic resolution. So we've yeah. already made the decisions and we did that based on all the feedback we had from the community. Um, and so, okay. so we can't go back and revisit. Um, now now so, revisit. Yeah. I just want so, to know whether staff can identify which, which area has been reflected to the a submission which area we still, you know, uh, but all, all can the, all we that, uh, all, change it or not? Yeah, but all that was yeah. done during the actual decision making on the on the design itself. 
Um, oh, so you'd okay. have to go back and have a look at the original design. This is purely on actually the, the detailed traffic resolution. So it's a very technical report. Because okay. as you can see, it's pages and pages of, of resolutions okay, um, okay. that just go into, you know, how long the lines are, yeah, etc. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yanni? Um, given that there's been, I think, about two years, over two years between when this was agreed by the last council and the detailed design coming through us, um, we've adopted the tree policy in the meantime. Is there any, has there been any reflection on removing the trees and what we might do? No, that's different? not up for discussion, Yanni. This is about actually a decision that's been made. It's the detailed traffic resolutions. Phil? Cool, this is good. I, I obviously wasn't here when this when this got done. So just so I'm on the right track, this is already, it, it's been to uh, everywhere. Yep. The, 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 um, where it's going to be put is all, everyone's happy. This is just the um, traffic stuff for it. L Lynette, wh why are we putting those, looks like red lines in there every time we're coming up to an intersection? Why, why do we have to do that? It's like little lines of three all over the place. Is it just warning someone there's a, there's a... Usually it's... So markings are about warning either the cyclists or the drivers, usually the cyclists when it's on the cycle track. Yeah, it's all, it's all on the cycle yep, track. So, so it's about warning markings to say... And do we have to put that in there? What, what I'm getting at, the cyclist is we not going that to, fast if we don't, they need we've, a problem. Like well, some the, of them do go Phil, Phil, I'm going to do the, the okay. same thing. We're going back to decisions. Okay, no, I just, already... I'm just looking at how much it costs yeah. to put that in. We... we... <laughs> Anyway, no, that's right. Well, I've got to go in, they've got to go in. But I, I just can't see the point of it. Now, just one other thing. <laughs> um, this is a shovel-ready one or not? Yes. It is cool. So the government pay for all of it? Yes. And the cost the of it is? Sorry, once, the, once again, we're, we're going beyond <laughs> what the actual item's about, okay? Spoke. Has it been moved? Oh, no problem. <laughs> okay, okay, we've got... Yeah. But I just okay. want... Yeah. Jimmy Chen's going to move and Pauline's going to second... Any debate? Uh, Jimmy? Okay. Yes, okay. Uh, uh, first, I still appreciate the staff, you know, the take the, the, the long time, you know, to establish this uh, comprehensive re report, in particular after the IT committee, back to the two years ago. But second one, because as a local council, I still would like to, on behalf of the community, you know, to, on their behalf, uh, uh, feel uh, uh, the, the uh, disappointed and the frustrating, you know, to see because uh, the based on those the uh, design uh, layout and the location, you know, because uh, some of the community and the residents they still they thought the uh, the council didn't listen to their uh, uh, the submissions. I just want to uh, take the two examples, you know, to uh, share with uh, my fellow councillors. First one, they thought the common road crossing introducing another unnecessary control crossing point when the existing nearby Buchanan common road crossing should have been utilized instead. Second one, particularly in the corner of the 126, the on the corner, because there is elderly disabled community center, that looks at every day, you know, Monday to Friday, week, weekday, they have uh, activity, etc. Et but uh, because the due to the uh, the uh, uh, cycleway, you know, to build up uh, on this side, so they lost their uh, uh, car parking. They during the uh, the submission before have a uh, full car parking, but based on all the final the, the detail res the traffic resolution, they didn't see the uh, anyone. They feel this uh, the uh, disappointed. But now because in uh, into the final stage of uh, this the. Uh, uh, the kind of the 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 the, the, the detail the design the legislation so the community we prefer that we can down the quickly efficiently efficiently and minimize the those disruption uh or to the community place the other ones I would like to comment because section one they also make some issue particular uh, intersection of water law and Gilbert Thorpe's law in that section is quite crucial where we push a prefer to implement those uh, the uh, traffic uh, or pedestrian uh, those the uh, safety issue we do hope you know this one can prevent the from the the, uh, the happen again thank you that's my uh, comments thank you jimmy anybody else all those in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed uh aaron 
sorry, Catherine, that was a thumb up for the I. Yep. Carrie, thank you. Excellent. Okay. Uh, item eight, the coastal hazards community engagement. Welcome. Um, I'll get you to give an overview of what the decision we're making today is, um, and then we can go into questions. Sure. Um, yep, we're on. <laughs> um, so my name's Jane Morgan, and this is Mike Anderson. Also presenting today will be Katie McRae and Mark Rushworth. Um, today we'll be briefing you on our proposed community engagement on coastal hazards and seeking agreement from you to release the documentation that sits behind that. Um, so we are proposing to run a comprehensive community engagement on coastal hazards across the two programs of work that underpin this. Um, so what we're proposing to release is a, an updated coastal hazards assessment and that is a document that's been prepared to um, provide communities with a better understanding of what uh, sea level rise will do in terms of impacts of flooding, erosion and groundwater across the whole district. We'll be releasing that document for information and using it to work with communities to better understand those impacts. We're also seeking your approval to release two documents for consultation. One is the Coastal Adaptation Framework, and that underpins the Adaptation Planning Programme, in which we'll work with communities to establish adaptation plans for the future. The other document is a Coastal Hazards Plan Change Issues and Options paper, and we're also wanting to consult on that. Mark will be briefing you on that um, piece of work. We're proposing to run the engagement from uh, tomorrow, essentially, through to the 15th of November. Uh, coastal hazards are um, a big issue um, relating to sea level rise, not just in Christchurch, but across the world. Um, however, in Christchurch we are quite exposed. We have a long, low-lying coastline and we have a lot of our assets and infrastructure located along our coastline. Um, there are two figures up there I draw your attention to. One is that um, there's around about a billion dollars of local government-owned um, infrastructure exposed um, across Canterbury. The majority of that will be in our district and around about $6.7 billion worth of buildings exposed along the coastline in, in the city. We've also started to see some research around the potential for insurance retreat to start occurring in you know, the next 30 years, which is <clears throat> relatively soon. So these issues really are all uh, driving us towards um, the need to start planning and working with communities in Runanga around how we're going to approach these challenges in the future. Um, a reminder that uh, we have, uh, you have established in August last year a Coastal Hazards Working Group and many of you here sit on that. Um, also alongside um, councillors we have uh, two Papatipu Runanga representatives on that working group and two ECAN representatives on the working group. We also have Selwyn and Waimakariri sitting in so we have that kind of joined up approach across the districts. Um, and the working group's responsibility has been to oversee these two programs of work, the adaptation planning work and the plan change. We've had a lot of value and input uh, from the working group and they've overseen the documents that we're going to be sharing with you today. So we know these issues are really challenging um, for communities, particularly the people who are affected or the, the um, homeowners in those communities and people who've lived in those communities but sometimes for generations. It's a very sensitive conversation to have and it has been one that hasn't always gone smoothly in the past. So we've done a lot of work around looking at lessons learned from past experiences. We've done a lot of listening to coastal communities over the last year or so as well. We've, um, we've been out and about in um, places like South Shore and other parts of the city, and we've really heard what communities are concerned about. We've also got some psychosocial advice um, around how we hold these conversations with communities in a way that is really respectful and um, empathetic and will understand their um, perspectives. So with all of this in mind, we are intending to try and do things a little differently this time. So um, you'll hear today that we are really releasing these documents very early in the process and we're seeking community engagement right from the outset. We want to know how communities want these things done. Um, coastal hazards information is pretty technical and quite challenging to understand, uh, it's very complicated at times. So we've put a huge emphasis on plain language, um, accessible information and we have a wide range of resources from videos that will come out next week um, to fact sheets to lengthy technical reports to short pieces of um, web information um, and an online portal. So we're really looking to cater for all different audiences. We're also seeking to have face-to-face -face conversations, so we really are hoping to um, 
be able to engage with a lot of different community groups right across the district over the next five weeks. It's really important that we hear different views. Um, we will really want to hear, of course, from our coastal residents. Um, we're also looking to understand what people across the wider city see as the, the values of the coastline, because we all use our coastlines. Um, and when I say coastlines, I do mean beaches, you know, rivers, estuary environments as well. And we want to understand how people um, perceive the cultural and ecological values in those areas as much as the social and community values. We want to understand how people value our infrastructure. Um, it's really important to us that we talk to children and young people because um, this is really about future impacts and the future of our city, and we, we, their voice will be integral to this conversation. Um, engagement with Naitahu is core to this piece of work. We have Naitahu Runanga sitting, um, Papatipu Runanga representation on our working group, and we'll be working with Runanga as we go into planning with communities. Um, just do a refresher on the adaptation planning program. Um, as you know, we are working on the flooding, erosion, and groundwater aspects um, and right across the district. So our purpose is to work with communities over time to develop those adaptation plans. Um, we know that we have a number of communities to work with, and so in November last year, you agreed that the program would be established and that we would start working in the Whakaropo Littleton adaptation area first up. Um, that process is intended to begin next year, and once that's concluded, we will then move around um, the district and work with other communities over time. And hand over to Mikey. No worries. So um, our coastal hazard assessment has been updated for the purpose of this work, as Jane's mentioned, and that really is that evidence base for both of those projects um, that we're looking at engaging on. We have been able to incorporate um, up-to-date new information, particularly around extreme water levels, um, sediment supply from the Waimakariri down the open coast, and rising groundwater as well as some of the, the key data changes there. Um, what this assessment tells us is how those existing hazards, so the flooding, erosion and rising groundwater, are likely to change over time with sea level rise. We've focused instead, um, so instead of focusing on some fixed time frames and fixed um, climate change projections in the future, we've really tried to shift the focus of this coastal hazard assessment to a range of sea level rise increments from zero in the, the current day status to 1.5 metres or 2 metres, which could relate to beyond 100 years in the future. And the reason that we've done this is it just allows us, um, one, to see the incremental change over time, but also um, so that we're not picking a winner. And if that data, particularly the climate change projections, and we have had a recent update, um, change, our, our data still broadly aligns with that. Um, it also allows us to see those points in time when we get some significant changes in our district as well. So... Um, for erosion, for example, um, with 40 to 60 centimetres of sea level rise, we see quite a change in our processes and it just really helps us to understand those hazards. Um, we've covered a wider geographic area, so previously um, it was just a few bays in Littleton Harbour and Akaroa Harbour, and we've now um, measured uh, flooding and erosion and groundwater for the whole of Banks Peninsula as well as the, the Christchurch city area. Um, we incorporated a, a technical um, review process, and that was a rolling technical review um, throughout as we developed our methodology um, and, and undertook the assessment. So um, that's provided us um, with a really robust basis for our science, and we also had um, coastal scientists from ECAN involved in that project team as well and just keeping oversight the whole way through the process. We know that this is um, a, a topic that's of particular concern to communities and we wanted to provide some opportunities in developing the assessment for people to understand um, what the information was that we were gathering and also um, help us shape up those communications that Jane's talked about. So we had a group of community stakeholders um, that were interested in coastal and environmental um, sort of technical work and we got them involved and they really helped us shape up those communications. Um, so what we are going out with, um, the, the really key piece of information is that online portal. This is um, an interactive coastal hazard map where you can change the time frame, the amount of sea level rise, zoom in and out around the district to see um, how those impacts might change over time. There's a lot of information on there. You can just get a quick view, you can drill down and understand a lot more information and we see that as the the first place that everyone should be going for this information. 
We've got a really long technical report which tells us everything we might need to know about our process that we took, but we've actually been able to distill that into a short summary report as well, which is about 25 pages and includes some really snappy area summaries. There's six for the whole district and they're just an A3 one page. They show give an overview of the coastal environment, uh, outline the different methodology that was taken in that area and then a bit of the key findings. So generally what might happen in the shorter term and longer term in these areas. If nothing else, that is the one thing that would be great for communities to be able to have a look at. We've also um, got some uh, short videos coming out um, next week where we've tried to concretise um, some of the impacts of what these coastal hazards might mean in different areas, and we've got coastal scientists talking to those videos. So they'll be, again, um, something that we'll be rolling out in our engagement with communities, and we encourage you all to have a look. Uh, that's probably it from me. I'll pass over. <laughs> So alongside the coastal hazards assessment, we are seeking approval for you today to um, release the coastal adaptation framework. Essentially, this is setting out Council's proposed approach to undertaking adaptation planning with communities. The reason we've done this is that we want to be really upfront about our proposed approach and we want to seek engagement from the community around that, seek feedback um, to, to make sure we've heard those voices. Um, our intention is that we want to um, have a relatively equitable process as we roll this out across the district and the perimeters sort of set within the adaptation framework will provide that, um, that continuity. We've also seen examples around the country where they haven't kind of um, front-footed exactly what council will um, be prepared to accept or not and after lengthy community engagement sometimes adaptation plans have stalled so we wanted to get ahead of that um, potential for that to happen. So the adaptation framework sets out council and community roles and responsibilities, guiding principles and a proposed engagement and decision making process and this is really what we're hoping communities will engage with and provide us with feedback on over the next few weeks. Uh, we are um, setting out our, our legal roles, um, essentially council's role primarily is to manage risks to our own assets, our public infrastructure which of course we are the, um, the shepherds of for the communities. Um, and we are um, being upfront that council does not have any explicit legal obligation to protect privately owned properties from coastal hazards. Um, the private property, private asset owner's role is similar. It is primarily to uh, manage risks to their assets as well. So we're just um, putting that up front to um, make sure that we're being really clear. The guiding principles, um, they are longer in the, in the framework, but I'm, I'll summarise them for you today. Um, and these are them here. Um, we see it as really important to um, go through this process in a partnership approach with Naitahu um, Runanga. Um, obviously there are a lot of cultural values around the coastlines and um, therefore it's really important that we take a partnership approach there. We know that um, every community is different. We're not looking at a one-size-fits-all approach to adaptation planning by any means. Um, in every community there'll be different scale issues, there'll be different coastal environments, and there'll be different values. And we want to reflect those in the way that we develop our plans. Um, the plans are likely to be different, we're hoping the process remains relatively similar. We are going to be undertaking adaptation planning with communities as a whole, but our focus um, and any public funds will be directed to public assets that underpin those communities. So we're talking about the roads, the waters, the parks, the things that um, build, build communities and that communities are built on. So it's going to be a comprehensive look at communities with a focus on those assets for um, public funding. We are probably working in an environment of, of, of the most uncertainty of, of many projects, although um, uncertainty is kind of the flavour of um, our lives these days. But we, we don't know exactly when these impacts will occur or where, um, or exactly the timing of, of those impacts, I should say. Um, we don't know what um, the statutory environment will look like in the future, and we don't um, know what technologies may be developed um, to address these issues. So the best we can really do is look at a range of options with an open mind and a range of scenarios and try and be as adaptable as possible as we're planning our process. Um, the IPCC report said that the impacts of sea level rise are likely to occur for centuries and millennia. So it's really important that we are recognising the intergenerational equity issues here. Um, we can't afford to kick the can down the road and make this a problem for our children and our grandchildren and their children. Um, we need to take a more responsible approach, we think. And so what we'll be looking for there are adaptation options and pathways that are um, not 
forcing the, um, the burden onto future generations, and there may be some tough decisions that we have to make in that respect. We, uh, the last two um, bullet points up there really come from the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement that guides a lot of this work, and we are required to prioritise natural and nature-based options um, over hard protection options. Um, we won't always be able to find nature-based options that work. Sometimes we'll have to go for hard protection, but we have to remember that um, the environment has to adapt as well, and sometimes there are options that are more amenable to helping that and others that are less so. Um, the coastal policy statement also requires us to keep managed retreat on the table. That is not us saying there's a predetermined outcome of retreat. That is absolutely not what that is about. It's simply saying we can't knock that out and dismiss it as an option. It is something we're going to have to have conversations about um, because in reality there will be some areas in which we will have to retreat from in the future. We're also setting out our proposed engagement and decision making process and what we are suggesting here is that we will establish a coastal panel to work in each adaptation area. So it will be a different coastal panel as we move around the city. The coastal panel will have uh, community representation and runanga representation on it. Um, we're also looking for, um, there will also be a zone committee rep and a community board rep from those areas. And um, we, will, we have the potential to add citywide um, representation as well. So what we're really looking for on those coastal panels is diversity. We want to have diverse voices diverse ages and demographics. So there is a requirement for us to have two young people on each coastal panel. We, we may have more, but that's the minimum. Um, and where we may not have, um, for example, in the community, someone who steps up with perhaps commercial expertise, that's where a citywide representative could be appointed into the panel to allow for that, um, that mix of different um, voices. The coastal panel's role is to undertake an analysis of all of the adaptation options and identify preferred adaptation pathways for a council decision. They'll be supported in that by a specialist and technical advisory group, or the STAG. Um, on the STAG, we have a range of experts. So we'll have, um, we've got you know, a planner, we'll have um, economist, uh, public health expert. Um, of course, we'll have coastal science and coastal um, engineering, and a range of other voices. Um, we have um, cultural expertise from MKT. So their role isn't to vote on anything, but it is to help provide the coastal panel with um, expertise and um, information to support their decision making. Um, sitting on top of this process will be an independent chair. We are cognizant of the wider community's interest in this process, so at particular points as we run through this process, we'll go back out and touch base with the wider community and just check in with them and get feedback on where the coastal panel is going with this um, process. So that's what's in the coastal adaptation framework. Attached to the coastal adaptation framework is this catalogue of coastal hazards adaptation options. And it's essentially a literature review of the, the wide range of adaptation options that are available across these kinds of categories. So people often immediately jump to things they know that they've seen before, but there are many different ways of doing this. And we want to um, engage communities in this conversation around understanding some of the different things they might not have thought of the opportunities that sit in some of these different um, adaptation options, and also some of the trade-offs. You know, some options will um, help us to help the environment adapt. Other options might um, mean that we continue to have access to natural beaches. Others may not. So it's just understanding what's sort of on the table and what isn't uh, in terms of that. Um, when you're looking across those options, just to be clear, you know, an adaptation pathway is not just going to have one option, it probably will have a mix of options and a mix across all of those different categories. So I'd really encourage people to have a look at the catalogue. Uh, there are two versions, there's a long literature review version with a lot of sort of more academic um, research sitting behind it, and then there's a, a sort of a mini version which is a bit more um, a, um, quick read for people who might want to look at that. So I'll now hand over to Mark to talk about the plan change. Oh no, I won't. Too soon. <laughs> we forget this slide. Um, I wanted to emphasise that uh, you know council working with communities is a really important part of this picture, but we are not the only players in this mix. Um, central government has indicated they will be producing a or putting forward a uh, climate adaptation act. It's intended to go to the house in 2023, and that's really to work through those complex issues around managed retreat because this is a, an issue that affects across. Um, coastal communities right across the country. They're also going to be looking at how to fund and finance adaptation planning, so that's something we're keeping a very close eye on. We've also been working really closely with um, Insurance Council of New Zealand because we know that homeowners are going to be really concerned about insurance. Um, the Insurance Council of New Zealand uh, you know, um, have talked to us at, le at length about um, the role of insurers is to uh, 
um, deal with risk. And so insurers are always looking at risk information right across the world. They're working with reinsurers on this. And so um, I guess the, the message there really is that, you know, this is a global issue and uh, there will be global decisions made by insurers. However, um, what the Insurance Council has said is that uh, insurers gain confidence by, by seeing that communities, councils and runanga, other stakeholders are working together to actively plan and manage these for these risks. And so the more, informa- the more confidence they can get that we are providing that um, guidance, that information is being generated around plans and around strategies, that gives insurers more confidence that they could remain in the market. Um, there's a fact sheet that we produced with ICNZ and that's on the website and I would encourage people to have a look at that. Of course, the regional government has, uh, ECAN has a role as well, and they are signalling that they'll be notifying their RPS and their um, regional coastal environment plan in 2024. So there are other players in this mix. We are um, we are just trying to do the part that we can do, which is work with the local communities that we are connected to. Yeah, Mark. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. Um, sorry, can I just... Thank you. So at uh, present, there's a gap in the current district plan provisions. Uh, It doesn't uh, reflect the full extent of the identified coastal hazards, and it doesn't manage all activities that could be exposed to uh, risk. As a consequence, uh, there's risk that development can occur without adequate controls being in place. Additionally, we need to make sure that the plan gives effect to higher order planning documents, in particular the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. So the uh, plan change is part of the wider program, as Jane has uh, said, and this is enabling a more holistic uh, uh, approach to coastal hazards. We're using the common data source, and I think the uh, the key distinguishing feature in terms of the plan change is it's focused on new development and seeks to manage risks ahead of the adaptation plans uh, being implemented. So we want to get ahead of the game uh, and not just be picking up the pieces uh, later. Um, So what are we doing different this time? We're aware of the previous attempts to incorporate the coastal hazard provisions into the district plan and we're looking to do things differently this time. We're proposing to take a step back from where we were before and allow more time for engagement with the community (laughs) and to have discussions about how we go forward. And the starting point we're suggesting is the issues and options paper that looks at a range of possible approaches that are available to us and seeks to get input to help confirm which direction we should take before we start to develop the more detailed provisions. We're also at this stage looking to uh, consider how we can incorporate new and innovative approaches to um, managing coastal hazards and development. And uh, Jane mentioned there's a the catalogue of options and some of the uh, ideas in there may come uh, into play in terms of informing how we can think about the district plan provisions. And we've also got a better understanding of the different levels of risk and how this could influence the plan as well. So the scope of the district plan um, change would be that it would be district-wide. It would consider all of the uh, coastline and uh, coastal hazard risks uh, across the city and Banks Peninsula. The primary focus would be around flooding and uh, erosion. Uh, We've given consideration to groundwater in there. And one of the other areas that we're wanting to uh, have a conversation around is how best to approach uh, tsunami risk, because these are uh, uh, significant but uh, more infrequent events. And there are other roles, such as civil defence, that come into play with that. So that's part of uh, the discussion here. And we're looking at utilising not just the baseline data from the coastal hazard assessment, but uh, doing some further analysis Uh, to look at uh, what that means in terms of risk to both people and property. So in terms of what's in the uh, issues and options paper, we've identified uh, a range of options and possible ideas as to how these can um, approach coastal hazard matters. We've not settled on a specific solution and we're seeking feedback to help provide a steer as to which option should be developed further. However, we have identified a preferred option that we think cons- uh, is uh, worthy of uh, more careful consideration. And I'll come on to talk about that now. So the preferred option uh, recognises that the level of risk isn't uniform across all the hazard areas uh, and that uh, there's a range of management responses we could uh, develop to uh, manage those risks 
in response to the different uh, local circumstances. Areas at risk from coastal hazard being separated into uh, a, a range of risk categories, and that's been uh, based on international best practice. And this allows us to take a more balanced approach to facilitating land use and managing risk so that we can enable communities to continue to meet their social and economic and cultural needs where it is safe to do so. So in terms of the um, uh, flooding uh, aspects uh, and risks, we've considered uh, the certainty of hazards occurring and the potential for change that could happen over time. Uh, we've looked in particular at the depth and speed of water inundation and the consequences that has for both people and properties. And as a result of that, we've identified four categories of risk. And this enables that finer grain approach uh, so we don't have to use a one size fits all solution through the planning framework. Moving on to erosion, uh, the impact of erosion is always going to be high. So likelihood was selected as a key determinant in uh, identifying the risk categories. We've also looked at the five different types of coastal environment. So that's ranging from the, uh, the dunes on the open coast uh, around to the uh, cliffs on the uh, headlands. In most instances, the, um, the, there's not as much differentiation um, for erosion as there was for uh, the flood risk. So there are only two categories of uh, erosion risk that have been identified. So it's a medium high um, uh, risk and a low risk. And again, what this enables us to do, to combine with the different um, uh, risk environments, is to come up with uh, a more uh, bespoke response to those particular hazards. And then finally, just wrapping um, up the um, why we're looking at doing things now and, and, and perhaps not delaying for uh, things that are coming down the track. We're aware that there is uh, significant reform of the uh, Resource Management Act uh, in process at the moment. We've taken advice from the Ministry for the Environment, uh, in particular on the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. And the advice is that that um, policy position isn't likely to change. It will be rolled forward and in incorporated into the new national policy frame, uh, national planning framework. And therefore, we've got some uh, confidence that the policy environment is, uh, is going to be reasonably stable through that period of change. Um, the other matter here is that the um, whilst the Natural and Built Environment Act may go through Parliament and be a, a, a put on the legislature next year, uh, there's a, going to be a gap between enactment and any new plans coming into place, and that's possibly several years that uh, uh, could go by. And for us, the uh, major concern there is that there is a risk that development will continue to happen in areas that uh, are exposed to risk. And uh, we think it's therefore uh, prudent to be approaching that uh, topic now uh, and consulting on the issues and options paper. So just quickly, I'd like to go through the communications and engagement we've got planned for this. Just to slide up again, just to show you, we've got the Coastal Hazards Assessment out there for information that's available in the summary report and the full technical report and also the online viewer. And then for engagement, we have the Coastal Adaptation Framework and the Coastal Hazards Plan Change Issues and Options Paper. So our challenge for this, um, this project is actually getting that diversity of voices involved in the conversation. We're very confident we're going to be able to hear from the coastal communities but as um, my colleagues have already said, it's also really important that we hear from youth, um, from children, uh, from people across the city. So our solution to this is to be, make it as, as relevant and as accessible as possible. We've used plain language in all of our documentation and we've really tried hard um, with some quite technical stuff to make it as accessible as possible. We have that online portal, the Intuitive Maps, which are a huge step forward on anything we've uh, had previously. And we've got that information for different levels of interest. So if people are um, minorly interested, they can pop onto the website and have a quick overview. If they have uh, more of an interest, we have fact sheets available for them, which goes into a little bit more depth. And then they can lose themselves for several hours or days in the technical reports if they would like to as well. We've got videos as well, and we're going to have information available electronically and in hard copy format. 
We're going to have drop-ins around Christchurch and Banks Peninsula, and we're also going to where the people are. We already have uh, made it to the guest list of some uh, residents associations and uh, networks out there, uh, and we will continue to, um, to sort of like... Um, uh, plug what we have to offer in the hope that we'll get further invitations um, um, over the five weeks of engagement. Uh, we've got targeted youth and children's engagement as part of this process and we're going to be using all of the channels available to us, uh, newsline, newsletters, websites, social media and we've also got some library displays as well. That concludes our presentation. Thank you very much, that was excellent. Uh, questions, Jake? Thank you. Um, on the subject of the coastal panels, was there one or was there, there multiple of them? How many did you envision and what kind of areas do they encompass? So we're starting, we're proposing to start in um, Whakaraupo, Littleton Harbour next year and we would have a coastal panel that would sit across that area. Yeah. Um, and so when we were to move to another community, we would establish another coastal panel. And in terms of the workload for these panels, what kind of commitment are members on it making? Um, well, we haven't done this before, but um, our best guess lo looking at other projects around or similar um, processes around the country is a year, a year and a half, um, probably meeting once a month, um, that type of thing. There will be some engagements with the wider community. Um, we, we may have Wānanga with Runanga as part of that as well. Um, it's a bit hard to tell, um, but we will be um, providing an honorarium to the coastal panel members. Thank you. And I should say also we're, we're providing them with some uh, training and support because sometimes being a representative for a community can be quite challenging. Did, did you give any consideration to just funneling this work through the community boards? And, and if that wasn't desirable, why, why not? We, uh, we did consider that. The model that's more typically used is a coastal panel model, which is almost like a sort of a, more like a citizen's jury approach. Um, and I guess that what you get from that is, is the diversity of voice that um, may represent just... People who live in a community, they may not otherwise be actively um, engaged in these issues, and I suppose that's some of the benefit that we were looking at there. Mm -hmm. Tim. Thanks. Thank you. I'll start with the easy one. With our modelling, our mapping, you know, like we, we can go in with regards to um, pressing a, a button. So with regards to that, is that, so for instance, we go in today, there's estimated global climate um, change, etc., sea level rise. So in 10 years, if I go into it, so is it going to be kept current to how this, the, um, the acceleration or deceleration of climate change is, is happening? It's a really good question. Um, so at the moment, our modelling... I'll do the odd one, mate. I'll do the odd one. <laughs> at the moment... Yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to give you bad news, so I've got a sugar coat first. No, <laughs> no, no. no. Um, ultimately, our current modelling is based on a baseline of 2020, which is when a lot of our data was sort of current for, and particularly our, our land level data, so it's based on 2020. Um, and we, the way that it works is if you want to move the slider up a time frame, it'll give you a range of sea level rise scenarios, so those future climate projections that that sea level rise would relate to for that time frame. So you can kind of look at the more pessimistic version, the more optimistic version, and sort of draw your own um, consensus really around, around which sea level rise you want to look at. Over time, if um, the sea level rise is accelerating or maybe those projections change, we can actually just update the little bit of the future climate projections to show that, and it will move, you know, higher up the sea level rise band. So we've got quite a lot of flexibility in the way we've done this modelling. Or lower, depending. Correct. On yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. And, and my second question. Um, second question. Um, the comment with regards to um, continual development in high-risk areas. So there was a comment made with regards to councils not responsible. But, but technically, if we're allowing to um, develop in high-risk areas and future high-risk areas, looking at the, the plan that you can go on. Um, will there be a legal case at some stage, I presume, that if councils are relevant of where they are in New Zealand are allowing development in high-risk areas, that we and we are uh, we are aware of it, do, will there not be a comment at some stage that we are responsible? I'm just thinking just... I think it might be better answered by um, yeah. Council Legal. Okay, um, well, just, if we could get just a comment on that, but going back to the first with regards to allowing development in high-risk areas and areas we know, 
what, what I mean, because we've got infrastructure, we've got a whole lot of problems there if we're going to allow it. What's your comment with regards to that? Is there going to be an option for us to say no? Um, yeah, I mean, it, I say at the moment there there is a gap in the plan, so um, development uh, can take uh, advantage of the other provisions in the plan, and and uh, uh, in some cases development will be permitted or controlled, so will be able to happen. In other cases, uh, we may have some degree of control through uh, the um, assessment criteria, but. Um, what the uh, looking at the plan change will do will be allow us to fill that gap so we can then uh, look at what the appropriate levels of control are um, and certainly as the level of risk increases you would expect the level of, sort of control would step up and it will be uh, not necessarily a case of uh, prohibiting development but it will be a case of much more stringent uh, assessment criteria needing to demonstrate that uh, if development were to occur then it wouldn't uh, pose any uh, unacceptable risk to uh, people or property. Would one of those requirements be that the house would have to be bought easily moved? Uh, that, that could be one of the options. Uh, we're, we're looking at, at uh, a range of different uh, factors. So it may be things um, like raising floor levels as a simple uh, thing, as happens in some of the flood uh, areas at the moment. Um, it could be about um, uh, having more um, uh, adaptable buildings uh, uh, or relocatable buildings. And there may be uh, some um, looking at uh, time-bound uh, restrictions around that so that when, when certain things happen, that's the trigger point at which you have to look at uh, relocating away from uh, the hazard. So I, I guess one of the th things which is a concern is you go and you see a house quite high up but the infrastructure that supports it. So if the sea rises half a metre, our, our ability to storm water and sewage, etc., is almost impossible in, in a low coastal area. But the house will be fine because it's on a wee island. And that's actually where the adaptation planning conversation comes in because that is about a more coordinated approach, I suppose, um, between council and communities around how we plan forward. Cool. Thank you. Anne. Good evening. Kia ora. nice to see you all. Thank you for that. That's a huge amount of information. It's, it's hugely co complex. And so the challenge, as you've said, is to try and communicate this stuff in a way that people understand. And um, I'm interested in the comment that was made about the training that um, council will, or council staff will be having to manage the sensitivity yeah. about these issues and dealing with the community. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit more about that. Yeah. Um, we all recently, the project team all recently went through um, some training and it was really around uh, cognitive science, um, how people understand and, and um, interpret information and particularly when they're under stress or when the information is about something that's really uncertain. Um, there was a real emphasis on storytelling. Um, it doesn't go naturally with some bureaucrats' minds to be storytellers. <laughs> We're working on it. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but no, it was really helpful. And it just, it also is um, similar training will be given to the coastal panel, but more with a focus around some of the learnings from the How Team experience, which was that it is tough being a community representative um, available to your neighbours at the same time as representing a, a, or participating in a process that will lead to some decisions being made. So um, Hummingly delivered that for us. Um, that's um, Jolie Wells. She's a, a locally based um, cognitive scientist and it was an excellent training session. Really recommend it, yeah. Right, that's really great to hear that that's happening. Um, I'm particularly interested in how you're going to manage the conversations with young people and children because of you know, that line between giving information and not creating anxiety. Yes. And um, I think that's, uh, I'd like to know a bit more about how that's going to be managed. We've actually had um, Sean Carvel from Future Curious working with schools in the areas that are likely to be impacted by sea level rise for the last year and a half. And she's um, been doing that with us, but also because she developed a climate change curriculum that was accepted by the Ministry of Education. We've worked with her to add in a couple of extra lessons around adaptation and some of the team have helped to teach those. Alongside that is a resource, a wellbeing resource, which again recognises that climate anxiety is of concern. Um, but really, the, I guess the key message is for young people, it's about feeling that they have a voice and can actually um, provide meaningful input into this discussion and shape it. And that's what we're trying to respect, I guess, with the um, focus on engaging with children and young people in this conversation. Um, that sounds really good. And how about 
Fine. Yeah, how will you choose um, the young people that are going to be on the panels? So for this, oh, for the panels, panels. Um, that's an expression of interest process. But we do have um, some people who've uh, in the area that we are aware of. Um, so we'll be um, working with uh, the governance teams um, and also with uh, the community on on suggestions for that. But it is an expression of interest process. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, and thank you for the work that you've done. I know, you know, for those of us on the working party, we know we know how much work has gone gone into this. I, I guess just one thing that um, is quite different now than even when we had the last working party is just the whole pandemic and the COVID mm -hmm. thing. And I, I guess I'm just looking at the time frame, wondering, mm -hmm. um, given what's happening, which th things seem to be moving quite quickly in a very different direction, whether this is the best time to be doing disengagement um, just thinking of particularly a number of the communities that are in here are also the ones that um, there needs to be a huge focus on well-being at the moment um, I guess there's not ever really going to be a, a great time to have this but we do have a reason um, now to get this, this work underway so we have tried to um, I guess uh, Proof, proof, future proof our engagement tactics as much as possible. We're very mindful of what the communities are going through at the moment. Um, there will always be wellbeing considerations and we're going to be living, living with COVID now for, for quite some time. So I, um, I think it's probably um, a, we've done the best that we can. Um, we're mindful, obviously, there are some communities in particular where COVID is, um, is a bigger conversation and that's where the focus of their attention is going to be. But delaying this further is is not um, necessarily going to achieve much could, more. Could, have we thought, because we've also got two public holidays in here as well, mm -hmm. have we thought about extending the time frame out? So we deliberately included the public holidays for um, the sense that sometimes that actually works in the favour mm -hmm. of um, groups to be able to, um, to do stuff over there. We had an opportunity of closing it before show weekend. We kept it open till afterwards because it gives people time um, to be able to put forward their feedback. It is open for uh, five weeks of engagement, but we've also been signalling quite clearly that this is coming for about a week prior. So we're probably looking at about a six week period of time. Right. In order to get this going before Christmas and leave it an appropriate time, and we don't want to run it too further into December, um, we thought that closing it uh, with about five weeks of engagement till the 16th of November is, a, is about as long as we want to take it. I mean, I mean, I just have a sense that our whole world's going to change in the next two months. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's happening up in Auckland hasn't kind of hit here yet, but it's no. all the stuff now is we coming. Can we can play it by are we ear, able to, yeah, to a certain kind of extent, but I, I think evaluate. I'd quite like to see how it runs. Yeah, are we able to kind of have a, a point where we evaluate mm -hmm. how the engagement's going and then look at if we need to make Absolutely. extensions because we haven't heard from some people in the community? And we know that a lot of the um, sort of like the, the meetings that we're, we're being hosted by others, if they don't happen in person, they go to Zoom. So we know that there'll be um, opportunities to, to go online, but absolutely we can look at a halfway point and see what happens, because who knows, in a couple of weeks. Yeah, and I think um, just also, I mean, the other thing is that, and our, our community board has certainly fed this back repeatedly, is we're still really worried about people that don't have access to the digital technology. And so, you know, there are parts of the area that that, that does relate to. Um, and so, especially with COVID and level restrictions, yeah. Not having face-to-face -face contact is quite a huge barrier to people engaging. So we've certainly taken on board your feedback there yeah. um, around um, hard copy, and we're looking at the displays that we can do in those local uh, community libraries. Okay. However, that obviously, if you can't go out, if you can't go to your library, yeah. then that okay. is going to affect it, and we take that on board. Just the other thing, the final question from me is, um, in, in terms of mm. like mm. the maps, if it, I mean, if you look at, you know, 59... Um, which is the Bromley to, to Oni Poto. Um, I, I mean, I just think being able to give people a bit of a, like, like some of the suburbs that are mentioned are sort of cut in half, like Wollstone. Um, so I, is there kind of a clear reason why those areas have been dropped off? I mean, half of Bromley's also dropped off, and I, I just don't get a sense from the information, really, that, that people will understand why. So are you able just to kind of give us an understanding of um, what happens in that grey area and why that's not being looked at? Yeah, sure. So we did focus our assessment on areas where the coastal influence isn't dominant, and by that we mean the areas where 
with sea level rise, the impacts are going to be a lot more prominent um, than, for example, the river and rainfall impacts, which is further upstream. We know the areas further upstream will also be impacted over time with these processes, but currently it is more dominant rainfall and river impacts. The rainfall and river impacts are already being managed currently through district plan, and there's also a lot of um, stormwater management that goes on in those areas and has gone on recently, um, and, and future plans that are in the works as well. So we know that the area that we need to focus on at the moment are those areas where the coastal influences are more dominant. Now, I know this is a kind of tricky um, thing to talk about, about where that line is. We have um, a... There is a technical basis for that. We took the, the river and rainfall modelling and we put it over our coastal modelling and we looked at where it lined up really well and where it was more varied further upstream and that's the basis for our line. We've also um, got some, some additions and some descriptions which we will add to our website um, over the next um, day or two that sort of that unpack that a little bit more and explain the basis for it. Having said that, even though that might be the um, the line for the technical information, it's not the line for the engagement. Mm. So we will be engaging with those communities, with drop-ins in the areas, and also with stuff in libraries. The, the, key, the key message, even if you're in the grey, you yeah. can still engage with Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Engagement. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Johnny. Jake? Um, something Anne said um, prompted another question from me on the panel. Who signs off? on the panel? Well, Coastal Hazards Working Group will make uh, assessments around the in expressions of interest. So they sign it off? Yeah. Cool. Anne. Just, um, just looking at the, the slide, the coastal, the roles and responsibilities, it's got a very, you know, very much a physical kind of lens on that. Is there a space where we think about our role in terms of community well-being in that space and are we clear that we've got that articulated in some way through this? Yeah um, I guess we've looked at this process right from that lens um, because it is about communities and people it's not really about the built objects um, in, the, in the environment um, and so we are gaining advice as we go through this process as I've kind of described to you a little bit um, but there is, is a bit more to it too around how we work with communities in a way that is going to be um, respectful and empathetic and allow for um, communities to, I guess, plan forward themselves. Um, the inclusion of, uh, we have an expert on the um, specialist and technical advisory group who comes from that, that perspective and we're doing a little bit of research into how we support communities through these decision making processes. So we've got a few things lining up uh, which will help us when we start engaging with communities in that really detailed um, adaptation planning space. Yeah. Is it, would it be appropriate to have something written in that particular part that talks about that as, you know, rather than, yeah, so sort of um, explicitly yes. say that? I don't know whether that's um, like, possibly with, uh, like a, 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 when read as a whole. Yes, our our paper on I'm trying to think what it's called at yeah. the moment. Coastal adaptation that framework. That one. <laughs> <laughs> I deal with the other stuff. I don't even deal with that one. But you know, our, our coastal adaptation paper is couched around this is with communities for communities, yeah. all that sort of thing. That's just one point we wanted to raise to people's attention in this forum just to be really upfront. Yeah, yeah. and it yeah. may be some feedback we get as well that we need to flesh that out a little bit more as we go through the consultation phase. Yeah. Thank you, that would be good. Excellent. Well, I'm happy to move this. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Templeton? Any debate? Okay, I'll... Pauline? Not debate, just to recognise <laughs> the incredible, incredible work in this and as a in part of the working group, we've got a big appreciation of that. But also, the, the um, I don't know, I just want to um, call out the way that you've presented this in a really clear, um, digestible manner and you've condensed incredible technical information into this format and I think that can't have been an easy task at all. And at, at the same time, you're... Um, including ability for people to go deeper if they want to. So I think you've really struck the sweet spot quite well and um, just really want to call that out. That's an incredible achievement. Thank you. Sarah. Kia ora, I'd like to support that. Um, the, the working group work and those workshops have been um, really well run and uh, really useful for informing us and helping with that, that conversation. 
um, and I'm looking forward to the, the next stage of this going forward. I think it's really important that the community have a say in that overall framework mm -hmm. for how we address ad ad adaptation over time. And I think that the, um, the district planning process, um, doing issues and options so different to last time, um, I think will um, get people on side where they weren't last time as well. I know that there's still some, um, still some distrust in the community, but I think that they can see that this looks so much better. And I think that you've done an enormous amount of work, all of you, in um, building up that trust. Um, and that's crucial for the work that we've got ahead. One of the things that's really important is that um, adaptation is going to be needed, um, but we're not quite sure how much and when. And one of the key things that plays a role in how much and when is how much, uh, as a city and as a, as a world, we're able to mitigate climate change by lowering our emissions. If we continue to em emit um, at the rate we are, um, emissions will keep increasing and the seas will rise um, higher than they might otherwise. Um, so this is um, linked completely to the mitigation work that we have to do. Um, and we all have to do that um, for the, the various coastal hazards, both sea level rise, coastal hazards, and, um, and drought and other things as well. Thank you. Anne. Um, I just wanted to congratulate the work that you've done, particularly in um, things like going to where the people are and targeted engagement and identifying key people in the community. I mean, those are really important things that you're doing, using plain language. You know, that's hugely, um, a, it's a real change, you know, I see in, in the way that we're trying to work with communities. And I just want to thank you for that, because that's a, um, it's a key, key to this, is actually getting people to trust and to move, for all of us to be, be moving together. So thanks for that. Um, all those in favour? Aye. Okay. Carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, we'll close the meeting with a karakia from Councillor Templeton. Kia whakairia te tapu, kia wātea ai te ara, kia turuki whakataha ai, kia turuki whakataha ai. Homie, hui, tai kie. Kia ora. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Catherine, I assume you said yes to the last. Yes, yep. I did. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.